So our first paper, our first panel, our first conversation piece is by Kendra Renee Salwa, who is assistant professor of ethnomusicology at American University. Her book project explores the relationships among aesthetics, ethics, and neoliberalizing discourses of citizenship amongst Moroccan hip hop artists and fans. She was recently awarded the Saharan Cross Roads Fellowship to study musical exchange between hip hop artists in Morocco, Senegal, and Mauritania. So Kendra, all you. Thank you, thank you all for being here. Uh, I wanna note at the start that the video I'm gonna play you will show a marked contrast between the reverberous sound that you hear and the situation in which it was recorded, so don't be alarmed. We'll just have to navigate that, that gap. Um, what I wanna do today is, I hope, really simple and concrete. Uh, I wanna ask how we can combine our understandings of affect with a deep contextualization and historicization that ethnographers achieve to better address musicians' lived experiences of tangled musical politics. Much of my work, as Jesse was hinting at, in grapples my interlocutors' material and imagined entanglements, the constant interplay between making music of local and national significance and asserting their belonging in a transnational hip-hop network from outside the sub-Saharan African diaspora. Both the interrelated realms of aesthetics and politics are subject to this dynamic, and to complete the triangle, choices in both of those realms take on ethical significance for the musicians that I work with. The dynamic mirrors the way that Moroccans attempt to make themselves as actors in the world, especially the francophone world, due to factors that I won't go into in my 10 minutes here. So when Sultana, an MC from Casablanca, and one of my chief interlocutors, is invited to Stockholm to perform, her effective labor is profoundly affected by at least three discourses. So first, let me briefly gloss what I mean by effective labor. I'm thinking about her work on herself, directed at her collaborators, or directed at her audience. Not towards a specific and enculturated emotion, of course, but towards a disposition or quality of engagement and receptivity. The discourses she and fellow musicians are dealing with include their received understanding as Moroccans of Sweden, more specifically Swedish resources and its reputation as a destination for migrants, as well as the importance of being a certain gendered Muslim and Moroccan subject for that presumed Swedish audience. This latter discourse is itself influenced by Sultana's recent history, where American and European actors who invite her to perform value her for that subject presentation and not for her art per se. So by contextualizing two short videos here, I want to discuss rehearsals as sites where we can watch artists working out their dispositions towards the pressures or contradictions of navigating this global north sponsored culture industry through or in sound. This includes but is not limited to music, so I wanna focus on the sort of sounds that exceed music in the videos here. These two clips are taken from a rehearsal in Sultana's hotel room a few hours before a concert in Albi, a suburb about an hour outside of Stockholm in August of 2015. The concert was aimed at the immigrant community in Albi, and every artist on the bill was chosen to reflect a nationality or ethnic group present in the community. So you'll see Sultana, her fellow MC and writing partner, Baus, and their DJ for the event, who goes by the name That Fucking Sara. They're simultaneously discussing the order of the set list, familiarizing Sara with the tracks, and rehearsing their raps. In the first clip, Sultana is rehearsing the song that made her famous in and beyond Morocco. It's called Sot Insa, or Voice of a Woman. In Moroccan Arabic, the song criticizes men and women who judge poor women who turn to prostitution, and has led to Sultana being hailed outside Morocco as a voice for women's rights in Morocco. So everyone in this clip, including me, understands that we are sitting in this hotel room at this moment because of Sot Insa. I'm not going to translate here because instead of thinking about the lyrics, I want you to listen and watch for the ways that with timbre, asides, laughter, facial and physical expressions, in other words, sound and movement together, she exceeds merely rehearsing the song. You'll see Sultana discussing the song and you'll hear me commenting before an edit that jumps to the first chorus of the song. In particular, her tone, her timbre, and the sigh in her words, the exhalation in her words, that, ex that uh, before that edit, exceeds the speech itself affects how I respond to her from behind the camera and frames how I interpret what follows. And this might be really loud. I just hope this sucks. My solo, it's about like one year I... You haven't sung so and so for one year? Yes. You know it. You're fine. I know it because I feel it. Yes, so much. exactly. So and so, so to net, you're dying for a glass. 
كتشوف فيكم حياه عمرها اللي ضاع كتشوفوا فيها الحمر خيف كيتباع كي yeah. كتشوف فيكم كي هي بغات تكون كتشوفوا فيها, فيها شفت الدل شفت المدلول تعيش بشرف حيت نجوم شاري اللي كاين لي ندز من حداكم ديروا فيها مسلمين yeah. تعيش خوتها حيت تجرى ساكن هو ما عايش في الكلام وانت في الفيلا ساكن ما تلوموهمش ما تسفاوش ما تسبوش نسلي جنان ومن تحت رجليهم ما تنساوش تقدر تكون امك تقدر تكون اختك تقدر تكون هي أنا وانتي Okay, so just a quick recap of what I wanted you to get out of that. So, uh, preceding the edit, um, she kind of sighs through her words. I remember this because I feel. Um, you see her forgetting some of the words, letting her partner Baus take over the rap in the chorus. She lets him kind of remind her of and catch her up to the words and some of the ends of the lines that she forgets. And then she um, makes a joke about putting a terrible R&B styling over the chorus at the end. Right. So I'm showing this because I think my audience will immediately hear what I hear in her language and her evasions, even if you don't understand the text. Yet I cannot interpret it without my extended ethnographic engagement. So since 2010, when this song was released, Sultana's career has been built on organizers, including those for the Oslo World Music Festival, the Trinity Hip Hop Festival, others, inviting her to perform in order to celebrate this song and the vision of a moderate yet devout, independent yet feminine Muslim MC that she now represents. In other words, we have a box for what Muslim women are like, and she breaks the stereotypes that we put on that box, so we like it. After spending years working with Sultana and watching her career, when she sighs, claims that she doesn't remember the words, lets Baus take over the chorus, diffuses the seriousness of the, th of the song by joking about putting a terrible R&B vocalist on the chorus, I hear a tension between how much she loves her work and how ambivalent she feels about being known only for this song, between how valuable her message is and how much she would like to be respected for her art rather than for the particular form of Muslim womanhood she now represents. I hear her negotiating the gulf between her desires and her expectations of the concert and trying to lighten her own affect to joke herself into a performance-ready disposition. The second clip is from the same rehearsal. In this sequence, Sultana and Baus are rehearsing the same portion of a verse several times. The goal for this in this clip is for Baus to correctly articulate a rest, a silence, and a pickup to his next line with precisely the right timing. Again, I won't put up the words. What I want you to focus on here is the intersubjective exchanges going on while very little is being said beyond the lyrics. With nonverbal sounds in tandem with expressions and gestures, Sultana coaches and gives support, and Sara the DJ watches in increasing concern until he gets it right. So when I watch this, I mirror the relaxation and release that you see in each person's body at the end of this clip. I gain an embodied understanding of the stress they're putting themselves under to get it right. I'm reminded in a way beyond my intellectual understanding of how seriously Baus and Sultana take representing Moroccans and Moroccan-ness to a revered nation in the global north and to all the members of the transnational hip hop network in their audience, including their fellow performers. Because I'm affected by their affect whenever I rewatch this rehearsal, I'm moved to consider and reconsider my fidelity to their motivations and their goals as I write about them dealing with such politics. 
So all I've done here is give small concrete examples of the ways affect can nuance our discussions of the politics of a global market for culture, a market which during live performance often amounts to a global market for effective labor. Much influential work straddling musicology, ethnomusicology, and anthropology has encouraged scholars to think in or with sound, to make arguments about sound in sound. I suggest we can find models for carrying out that suggestion in musicians themselves, but it requires a shift in, or at least in addition to, what we consider evidence. Critically for this panel, I suggest three things about that evidence. It's sounds that exceed the performed music, sounds that are intrinsically articulated with other embodied expressions. In other words, as an analyst, I need to be able to see and re-experience them with their co-movements, and I would not be able to be using this evidence in the same way if I only had the sound recording and not the video. And these sounded expressions immediately engage those witnessing the recording and witnessing the recording in turn. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Kendra. Okay, our second intervention. Um, so I have on, are we going in order? Should I shift to Kwame or you wanna do? Oh, okay, sorry, we're good questions. Okay, so let's do, um, I have a set of questions. Let me start with a few comments and then do you want to do panel and then, or should we do aggregator? Or? Okay, all right, so just a couple of small thoughts on that. So I think that it just raises the question, as you pointed out at the end, this is the relationship between the sonic and the visual um, on the one hand, the relationship between sound as evidence um, and sound as something that's being studied and the kind of blurring of lines between being someone who's a performer involved in making music in making images um, as well as someone who's then studying those as kinds of forms of circulation. So pointing out the relationship between starting with local global um, connections, how does something received um, in a local or national context versus how the same thing might be perceived and contextualized and re-intextualized in different ways in global forms of musical labor. And so then ending with thinking about affective labor, which I think is something that we can, we can think about both also as anthropologists, like what is the affective labor of the ethnographer? Um, so I don't know if the panel wants to bring in any comments. I can, I can, uh, I can offer a few co comments. Just this was really powerful, being able to see actually looking at these videos and thinking about these videos in comparison to just what we've discussed and, and, what we're, and what we're talking about in terms of this project and this work. One is seeing these interior spaces and seeing these spaces of rehearsal and, and the way that these spaces of rehearsal become places where musicians play out, but, but play out, I would say, what is the relationship between the actual performance, which needs to be filled with emotional meaning and kind of the heightened state, but also how these sounds get, get thought of and rehearsed and practiced. In some ways, I would, I'm just to throw numbers out there, like at, at an 80% level, but at a level that tries to really capture something of the meaning that ju in just a few minutes they're gonna be taking up on, on stage. So I think that that's incredibly powerful to think of. Also, I was on a panel a few years ago where um, someone was talking about the set list from hell and that we really need to theorize the set list from hell. And what this means is what are the, what are the songs that artists are so well known for that they have some response to it? I guess in terms of the set list from hell, you'd say they don't wanna perform. In this sense, it seems like Sultana certainly, I mean, the song is important, but when a song becomes so tied into your identity and the song that you're known for and you know that this is representing your local identity in this context of Sweden or in other contexts, what do each of these rehearsal sites look like in terms of how, how that plays out? Um, I like this idea of the sound exceeding the performed music even in a space where it's a very internal space that they're kind of working out exactly what this is gonna look like when they take it in front of, in, in front of thousands of people. Um, just to kind of add one more thing, I, I, I really like this idea of the what role, what is the work that the ethnographer or the researcher is doing? And, and in terms of having r strong relationships with musicians and being present and part of this, th this collaborative research that's going on, where, where, do, where does someone serve as a consultant, can serve as an audience, can serve, and where does someone serve as that? Or serve as um, even just creating a communal mood, which is very important to all musics, but particularly in terms of hip hop expression, if it's just the band rehearsing, to have an audience, even in these rehearsal spaces, gives it added meaning and intention. I, um, I'm thinking a little bit about ethics and its relationship both to field recording practices and the equipment itself. So I think of the Barbara Kruger piece that she did in the 1980s 
a huge poster up in Times Square that had the picture of a, um, it kind of looks like a Grecian statue, a woman's face, and in big block red letters, your gaze hits the side of my face, right? As a feminist statement about watching and looking, I always like to think about that in the ethnographic gaze. How does that translate to the ways that we record sound? Right, when are we simply gazing and capturing and processing according to the scripts that we've already got in place? And when are we affecting and, be and being affected? And I think that's what really struck me about Kendra's field recording is that she's picking up on that moment, that sigh. I know that feeling as a, an ethnographer who works with people for years and years and years. That um, sense that there's something that you need to respond to as an ethnographer, but also as a friend. So it's a co-engagement and a co-production. And in doing that, I think about the calibration, the ways that field equipment is calibrated to capture just the loudest sounds, right? And to um, filter out white noise. And isn't it, isn't it great that you manage to capture that sigh, but how many sighs do we not capture? Or we don't have the visuals to go with it so that we forget that they're there two months later or 10 years later when we go back over our field recordings. And secondly, I think about our practices with that field equipment how, and the recordings that we take. How do we store field recordings that have that off-label stuff? When does informed consent begin and end? How do we archive that? And you know, what kinds of resources do we need to be able to think these things through, think about how we archive our field footage and our field recordings, to um, not just think about how we store those digital files and archive them, but also thinking about our production resources. I know all of us are making, are using immense amounts of digital files and other kinds of field recordings. When do we get the resources to filter through those, to sort those out, to decide what goes in the archives, what gets destroyed, what gets given back to our consultants so that they can filter it and say, actually, I don't want you to show that moment. It's they are embarrassing or what have you. Um, not, not that that would happen in your case, but that certainly happened in my field, and you, I know when that, those times are. Um, so anyway, just thinking about the relationship of the ethnographer as an ethical um, person who's engaged in that co-creative space, and I think your clip shows that beautifully. It also shows how well you are integrated into the space that your um, consultants are performing in. Do you want me to respond to that? I'll just make one quick note to add on to what you guys both said, just said. Um, the video's at the angle that it's at because I'm sitting against the wall across from the coffee table, balancing the camera <laughs> on my knee. So it's that, like that kind of thing is part of my effective experience of recording it and participating, right? Like I can't help but remember that my back really hurt and like <laughs> later in the rehearsal when my camera goes it's because I had this shift because I like could not take it serious anymore, right? So those kinds of little things are embedded in my recollection and I don't, as you were just saying, I don't know right now how outside of my field notes which convey some immediacy but not all of it how to capture all of that non-verbal, non-recorded, non-textual stuff for later potential use. Um, so if we really want to attend seriously to the affect of co-engagement that's going on between the ethnographer and, part and everyone else, interlocutors, like do I need all that stuff too? And then what techniques do I develop for remembering that for myself, right? Can I, I can write down that my back hurt in my field notes. What does that convey the immediacy? I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. We're gonna continue the conversation with those pieces, so let's not forget those those comments. So I think Amber's next, or are we going in order? Yes. Great, so our next uh, speaker is Amber Clifford Napoleon, who is Associate Professor of Anthropology at University of Central Missouri. Her book, Queerness and Heavy Metal, Metal Bent, was published by Rutgers in 2015. She is on the editorial board of the journal Metal Music Studies, and her work is focused on sexuality and identity formation in music scenes and spaces. Amber, over to you. Okay, um, I feel like a little like I'm live at Budokan today, but <laughs> <laughs> um, 
so my work is on fans, which makes it slightly different than obviously working with musicians and performers themselves. Uh, what do fans see that we as ethnographers do not? And how can I, as a fan, uh, understand affect among my informants as both federal fans and as independent entities? How do these issues deepen and really grind against each other when both I and my informants are disrupting multiple layers of marginalization, oppression, and misconception? When I see these images, how does my affect as a queer fan of metal cause friction? Uh, my work is focused on heavy metal, both the music and the subcultural assemblage, specifically on self-identified queer fans and the way in which heavy metal provides those fans with roots for identity formation and world making. Uh, I've collected data from nearly 600 queer metal fans around the world at this point in hours of field recordings of various types. Uh, as a queer fan of metal myself, I'm also caught in what Kath Weston has termed native ethnography, that shadow land where my own experience and my informant's experience has become fairly deeply enmeshed. As I collected field recordings, I came to understand this potential problem as a methodological one, on one hand anyway, uh, and had to ask myself how to represent affect in the queer metal fan in a way that both defended and defied the bounds of my position uh, as a native ethnographer. This slide, for instance, tells you, I mean, if, if you look at the way people see metal, uh, and you look at instead what queer fans might be focusing on, those things might not be the same. Uh, and I, as a queer fan and an ethnographer, have to be looking at both. Uh, and that causes for me uh, considerable field friction, if you will. Uh, along with this particular friction is another, that field recordings alone are not sufficient. Uh, musicians and performers tend to have a language to describe, um, at, not perhaps extensively every time, but a language to describe their actions. Fans don't necessarily have that same kind of language. Fans don't necessarily have a language of fan affect uh, at which they can describe things for you. Uh, part and parcel of heavy metal is its performance and the spectacle of that performance. Metal musicians operate with often very closely guarded personas. Permission to record performances is hard to get and may not give me a fan perspective anyway. I don't work with fans in only one scene and significantly important bands, which are frequently the topic of my fans' interest, uh, closely guard the market share potential of a professional recording, including an interview recording. Uh, therefore, in my work, my field recordings also include video by fans, photos by fans, blogs and slash fiction, artwork, even social media chatter. A field recording is for me multi-sided, multi-gendered, multimedia work uh, that depends on my position as a fan, as an insider, to understand what those channels of evidence might be. Uh, without my native knowledge, access to these multiple terrains of fields would in fact be denied. I see these multiple forms of field recording uh, as the sounds of fan affect. I work in a really small department and I work really closely with a paleoanthropologist and a historical archaeologist, which normally has cultural people going, you do what? And the three of us work collaboratively all the time and the result of that is that I've learned to think much differently about words like evidence and artifact and excavation. <laughs> and I think I think about uh, evidence in much smaller um, pieces than I did sort of before. So I want to give you a couple of examples, if I can, of this sort of assemblage of field recording for me. Um, the first one, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is show you some images of bands uh, and then a little piece of video so it's going to get really loud. Uh, and, and then play a piece of a field recording uh, without video, just the sound. Uh, so that you can see how these things are essentially put together. Uh, so this is a piece of interview with a fan talking about masculinity. I ask a lot of questions about masculinity and metal. Metal is typically seen as hypermasculine, uh, and how fans sort of process masculinity, uh, whose gaze is at the front and whose is not. Uh, there's a lot of performativity involved there, obviously. Uh, so I ask some questions about whether heavy metal affects your masculinity and in what ways. Uh, so these are a couple of images. These are actually liner note images for a couple of what are called post-black metal or black metal gaze bands. Uh, and I haven't lost track of the fact that I'm talking about the gaze of gaze bands, by the way. Um, <clears throat> so the top one there is a, a, a album cover sort of promo piece for a band called Deaf Heaven. Uh, the return of Deaf Heaven, metal's most divisive band. Uh, that's their tagline. Uh, and then the bottom one there is a photograph from the liner notes for a band called The Botanist. Uh, black metal, especially post-gazy black metal, 
uh, is sort of known for degendering itself in a really interesting way. I mean, if you look at that bottom photograph and the botanist, there's not a clear way to certainly sex the person in those photographs, uh, let alone clearly in American mainstream terms, gender them. Uh, so let me play you a short a little piece of Deaf Heaven Live um, so that you can sort of get a feel for what that sounds like. Oh, if it decides to, maybe I'm not. This is a little loud. Maybe it's the click that's not loud. Hang on just a second. I'm not sure that's it. It's okay. It's okay. I wish I had my sound card to play it at. Everybody be patient with me for just a second. I'm not sure if I can play that. Let's try this one here. talk it through and we'll figure it out. All right. <laughs> We're going to pretend I, that I don't have clips. <laughs> um, so the clip that I was going to play, you can see that somebody who identifies as a gay b boy, B-O-I, uh, a black metal fan an interview that I did in March of 11. Uh, and what he actually talks about in that interview is the fact that he questioned his gender identity and his sexual orientation while he was still engaging with these bands uh, through recordings, CDs, MP3s, and looking at liner notes. And what he says in the clip is that it's through liner notes that he decided that his gender identity and sexual orientation were perfectly fine, uh, and that it was in then the act of seeing a live show that he was able to put together the fact that for him, the band illustrated his need to not identify in a really particular way. So he came to see himself as fluid because the band was fluid. Uh, the other one, uh, you can see this one. Those are photographs that I took. These are concert photographs from Rammstein. Uh, this is an industrial band from Germany that you may have heard of, one of my personal favorites. Um, so Rammstein is known for immense shows, major pyrotechnics, huge spectacles. Uh, they're also known for various, for highly sexualized shows as well. Uh, for instance, Till Lindemann, who's the lead singer, in the middle of the show he mounts a 25-foot penis uh, and shoots foam on the crowd. So this is a highly sexualized show as well. Um, one of the questions that I ask my fans is about cruising. Do you cruise at metal shows? Do you take dates to metal shows? Um, because for queer fans, that's an important question and one that I think non-queer fans assume isn't happening at metal shows. Uh, so the clip that I was gonna play that's not gonna work, but um, he talks about this experience at a Rammstein show. And then he's wearing a t-shirt from a classic Rammstein album and he scans the crowd and there's only one other person in the crowd with the classic album cover t-shirt. So he walks across the crowd, he stands next to this other man, just then Du Hast starts playing, which is a pretty famous Rammstein cut. And then he talks about the fact that while Till Lindemann is spinning around the stage with a flaming bow and arrow, uh, that their hands meet and that they hold hands through the entire rest of the show and look at each other and go, mm-hmm, Rammstein. Right. It's magic. It's Rammstein magic. Uh, so I, I think that those assemblages are sort of interesting ways for you to understand the multiple forms of what I consider field recording have to be. Uh, because for me, going to a metal show and recording what a fan is doing in the audience doesn't tell me it nearly enough. I have to be able to get all these mutual imbrications of material together. To give you one last example, uh, these are a couple of... of fan images of Rammstein. Uh, so the first one is Till Lindemann in a concert uh, in Germany. 
Uh, you can see he's wearing this pink fur coat. That's also, by the way, this is a, a photograph taken by a fan who was also working for a German newspaper at the time. Uh, that's also the photograph that the Russian government used as evidence when they decided to outlaw Rammstein. Uh, the Russian government outlawed Rammstein under the statement that Rammstein caused homosexuality. If you listen to Rammstein, it would turn you gay. Uh, and they used this photograph of Till Lindemann in a pink fur coat as evidence. Uh, the one next to it is a sketch of a Rammstein fan from Russia, uh, Till Lindemann in his pink coat. Uh, with the bubble there, and if you can't read it, what it says is, bitch, I am fabulous. Uh, so for me, studying queer fans, I have to have all of these little tiny pieces of evidence to put together a puzzle for which my fans don't necessarily have a language to explain. Thank you. So, Kendra, do you want to begin with yeah. comments? Um, so in some ways, I see that uh, what I just presented and what you just presented, Amber, are like two sides of the same coin, like watching musicians or fans kind of develop their own, uh, come to their own sort of dispositions about what they're doing. And it seems like we sort of looked at the two consecutively. I have a slightly different question, though. I'm wondering, um, I'm thinking about the sort of the loudness panel that I saw yesterday afternoon. And I'm wondering about the borders between um, music and sound and noise as categorized by fans. Um, do you, can you say anything about kind of where the distinction between music and noise lies for fans and how that might play into their experiences? Does anyone discuss that? Sure, some of them do. I mean, one of the interesting things about not heavy metal in particular, but heavy metal in this instance is that Heavy metal, while it appears from the mainstream to be sort of monolithic, heavy metal is very genre driven. And people of one genre will consider their genre music and somebody else's genre noise. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a lot of the conversation about that sort of line between noise and music really comes into play when you have queer fans arguing about whose genre is better, uh, right? Okay. Uh, and so there's a lot of that sort of, of you know, difficult conversation. At the same time, though, um, arguing about genre and heavy metal is like bread and butter mm -hmm. of being a metal. If you can't argue about it, then you're really not right. metal, right? So you have to be able at the same time to sort of defend your noise as music and somebody else's music as noise. It's like the classic George Carlin problem, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I mean, that conversation happens all the time. And I have a lot of fans, I mean, there's a lot of queer fans that tell me that they don't like metal for the lyrics that it's not the lyrical quality, it's the sonic quality. Mm -hmm. uh, and they tell me a lot of things where they're identifying affect and the sonics, right? Where they tell me that heavy metal is brutal and filled with rage and so are they and that's why they like it. And when I ask them what the lyrics are, they go, I don't have any idea, who cares about the lyrics? Did you hear that, mm -hmm. right? So they, they're identifying particular sort of aspects of the sonics uh, as both musical and affect. follow up on that, I am um, impressed with, I mean, metal artists are already theorizing, as we, as we as anthropologists try to theorize and elide the borders between sound texts, sonic texts, noise, etc. cetera, um, the people that we work with, the people who we work with are already doing that. And it's really interesting to hear what happens in a metal situation in resonance with my experience before my work in Senegal, doing work with Southern hip hop artists, particularly in the Mississippi Delta, and the blues artists and the gospel artists who are part of their communities. And Amber and I were actually having a conversation just before this panel about how both of our cars are outfitted with immense sound systems, <laughs> like big, very loud, really <laughs> nice sound systems. Great. <laughs> Labors of love, I'm sure, because none of us. Okay, because it matters to me. When I listen to the music that I study and I love and I DJ, I need to be, I need to hear all of the registers of the bass, with, which actually works its way through my car seat and gives me a back massage before I can actually hear it, <laughs> right? I mean, I might not be able to hear it through my ear, but I hear it, my solar plexus hears it. The bones in my skull are rattling. I can hear it de-stratify the relationship between my muscles and my bones and my back. So I'm just thinking about 
instead of trying to mine something from the text, to trying to mine something more from the text, what happens if we work from the soundscape backwards or more broadly, the sensory scape backwards? So in my fieldwork in Senegal, I was looking at fashion, for instance, the patchwork robes that people wear, and thinking about these excess materials that are kind of tossed away that become something when they become part of an aesthetic practice, right? So something that's um, excessive and marginal and trash becomes the substance of the most beautiful robes that you can find in Senegal. These, these are called jahas robes, Sufi robes. Um, and then food ways, thinking about the tastes of the food, right? As it could articulate to the way that I approach musical experience or sonic experience in the field. And then in my, um, in my bedroom in Senegal, and I can't explain how it happened, I was on the second floor um, of a very square, flat-walled um, apartment, but for some reason, I got a camera obscura through the two French doors to my room, and as I was working on my manuscript and unpacking my field notes, I would look up and I could see a cross-section of the street below, I can't explain it, I could see the cars going by and the names on the cars and the horses and buggies, and thinking about that refraction, right, as a way to approach sound and to approach reverberation, I think are all ways to contextualize what we do according to the richness with which the people we work with are already thinking about sound. Thank you very much. The two very brief comments I would add is that you started out with talking about sort of, I think you used the phrase grinding, and you said friction. So I'm just thinking it, one of the broader questions being about the aesthetic as a framework. Mm -hmm. So thinking about how do, how do ideas of the aesthetic often presuppose a sense of coherence or a sense of singularity, but in fact, we're all in some ways talking about contradictory modes that are kind of mm -hmm. grinding up against each other in ways, and then people real, in real time kind of performances and rehearsals are trying to navigate these contradictory forms in ways that are about affect. So I thought that was a really nice way to start. And the other thing, this sort of scalar thing about loudness. So how does loudness become a way to imagine space or reimagine your body in space? So it becomes a way that we can think about sound as recentering the visual. Um, so, okay, so on to our third paper. Or did you want to respond in any way? Or are you, good? Uh, well, you know, so I do some work and some writing about this idea of a loud space, right? I mean, Ali knows, I, I, I work with the concept of scapes, right, the theoretical concept of scapes. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in this idea of um, what I've started calling sonic architecture, right? In what ways do sonics create uh, an architecture of their own, uh, regardless of what the actual physical architecture of a space might be, and how does that sort of sonic architecture then inform things yes. like experience and identity and, and world making? I think it's an interesting concept that we have to unpack a little more. Very nice. Thank you very much. Our third intervention is Anthony Kwame Harrison, who is the Gloria D. Smith Professor of Africana Studies at Virginia Tech. Uh, Kwame's scholarship examines independent hip hop production in the US. His recent articles, Reconciling Gepetto in Collaborative Anthropologies and What Happens in the Cabin, Journal of Society of American Music, utilizes an arts-based research practice approach. Over okay. to you, Kwame. Thank you. Um, I really like what's going on here. Mine is a little bit different it's, it, because I'm not talking about fans, and so it's a little bit different from what Amber is saying, and it's a little bit different from what Kendra is saying in the sense that I'm dealing only with, with sound, not, not any visuals. Um, but it's in conversation with a lot of the points that Ali has brought up. So since 2001, when I began ethnographically researching independent hip hop in the San Francisco Bay Area, I've engaged in a series of collaborative relationships primarily surrounding composing and recording music with an evolving series of artists. The sonic evidence of these collaborations and the way they shift the politics of the ethnographic encounter can be seen in various material artifacts, um, mostly CDs and 12-inch and records that I've co-released with, with these musicians. By joining these musicians at their insistence in creating hip-hop songs, I was at a most fundamental level making my voice and presumed efforts at self-articulation susceptible to their creative manipulations and recontextualization. So just the way that qualitative researchers can take interview transcriptions or can take field note observations and embed them within theoretical discussions that may betray the meanings of what these social actors actually had, in the same way by joining these musicians, 
um, in taking part in what George Marcus and Douglas Holmes call a para-ethnographic project in which my epistemic partners who were organically intellectualized musicians themselves were, were creating something. I was really giving them control to recontextualize and to represent me. Um, so one of the points I just want to make to begin is just that this level of, of shared vulnerability as a means of coordinating both the temporal and spatial coexistence of research and performance is really important. How can we minimize the impact of the researcher's gaze on the emotionally delicate and intimately experienced process of music making and particularly vocal, vocal making? So while we can talk about ethnographers spending time and gaining trust and finding roles, I really want to say that this, that this kind of shared vulnerability inspires qualitatively different performed identities within space, and they're performed identities that, are, that, that foreground the power dynamics of, of the ethnographic encounter, but in fact create solidarity that's predicated largely on our abilities to represent one another. And I, 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 when saying it like that, it sounds a little bit ideal, and it is, my, my article in Collaborative Anthropologies does talk about some of the problematics that surround that and deal with that, but that's just an important first point. A second point that I want to make, and in terms of my own research and sound methodologies, is that, is that through, in addition to cultivating these mutual vulnerabilities, this is augmented by a documentation process that organically aligns with the spaces in which ethnographic engagement takes place, and that's the recording studio. So to put this another way, through the project of recording music, which includes both, both efforts that get featured on finished songs, but also outtakes and inaudible and illegible bits of recording um, that most listeners don't hear or don't, or don't recognize, through doing this, we are making literal records of the process that, as an ethnographer interested in music production, I, I'm most interested in. So whereas other research researchers might try to get people to forget about the tape recorder, forget that it's there and running. We always know about the tape recorder because that is what it is. It's about recording this. Um, in the remainder of my comments, I just want to talk about a couple of things. One is the value of unreleased work because indeed many of the recordings that I have been a part of and collaborated on have not been, have not been released. So, so there's this, and where people often think about unreleased work is somehow substandard. I had some friends who, who saw, who heard the Beatles unreleased stuff and it immediately inspired them. This stuff is so bad that we need to make an article about the role of the producer in making music better. I want to say that these are important sites. The unreleased materials offer important insights into the process rather than the final product of recording. The other point that I want to talk about is how a shared, how a shared collection of isolated recordings offers an, a, an initial illustration of a method that I'm calling audio excavation of recording sessions. And, and, and this approach, I argue, provides a means to connecting the materiality of the sonic assemblages with the spatial and temporal context of their creation. So, so, um, so just to begin with, there's a space called The Cabin, and I don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but it's this unique recording site in San Francisco that has an evolving community of musicians that I've worked with for over 12 years. Initially, most of the musicians that worked there were primarily oriented towards hip hop. But over the years, as social networks have changed and as career trajectories have shifted, this involves an, a, a revol a mix of, of musicians of, of various genres, some very much rooted in hip hop, but some working in other places. Notable among these is my collaborate, collaborator, Tim Cohen, who's described as a, quote, a figurehead in San Francisco's independent garage and psychedel psychedelic rock music scenes. And he's the creative force behind two bands, The Fresh and Onlys and Magic Trick. Throughout the years, Tim has been my constant collaborator. It's, it's his studio is, is, the cap, is the cabin. The fact that these recordings take place in, in, in this space and among this circle of folks who are not primarily invested in hip hop explains some of the reasons why these recordings haven't been released. With, with professional identities in other places, these are largely seen as spaces to come together and to practice and to work things out. And indeed, Tim has said several times that the time he spends focusing on hip hop is a space that allows him to develop some of his other songwriting in, 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 in other, other genres. So when I first started recording in the, cap in the cabin, Tim and the other musicians that regularly came through mentored me in learning the techniques and performative dispositions of, of hip hop recording. In this shared space of creative production, activities get coordinated through a system of organizing practices that manifest 
in terms of collective orientations, aesthetic sensibilities, and inclinations. The recordings in the cabin take what I, I describe as a, or the practices take what I describe as a first take orientation to recording, and that's primarily vocals. And by that, what I mean is that most songs are recorded on the first or second take. It's rarely, in terms of vocals, it's rarely that we see more than three takes on, on a song. And as Owen Marshall, who presented earlier, gave a great paper earlier in his conference, talked about in his paper, vocal recordings that are done in the first take are usually the most invested in terms of meaning, but technically flawed. So, and, and as you do additional takes, typically they become more precise in terms of what people are try actually getting at, but some of that meaning, meaning lessens. So again, I want to champion the recording session that isn't dri driven by technical perfection of an imagined final product that will be released, but is rather about the meanings and expressions that come out. And indeed, during Tim and my time together, we say that, um, Making music together may be the only way that, that we know how to spend time together, that and, and, and thinking about sports, so, so, and watching sports. So, so thinking about these musical excavations, I just want to move to them as we're, as we're running out of time in my initial comments. And I want to kind of highlight in this how we can map the processes and arrangements that underlie musical creation by listening carefully to these isolated tracks. In these Sonic stratigraphies, we find clues and traces which help to reconstruct the situational context of recording beyond what's recorded in our observed field notes or in a post-recording interview. We get the sounds of presences and absences, how raised and gendered bodies are positioned in the recording space as the tape is running. We get the mood uh, and, and the atmosphere that's going on and the way that that gets manipulated by inter social interactions that are going on as the, as the recordings are running. And we also have decisions regarding pre-recording sound processing that both animate, things like echo and reverb that both animate space and animate time. So just to give one example, this first example is taken from November 2008, the short stop recording session. We just finished recording the song, everything except the chorus part of the song, and I specifically instructed Tim, just listen to the song, and when it gets to the chorus part, do whatever comes to mind. And if this will play, here, here's what he came up with. Um, Wonder can that perform at this time? Hmm. Um, hold on, let me, let me try this. One more, we seem to have, we seem to have some audio issues here. Okay, well maybe, I don't know which one. Maybe. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, okay, outs outside of that. Well, well, what we have is, is Tim coming up with this Thing called, like this, just this chorus called "Ruler of the N Ruler of the Night," and he just started singing this part called "Ruler of the Night," which indeed ended up being the main part of that song that was never released. Four years later, when Magic Magic Trick released their album, "Ruler of the Night" was the title of the album and the title track, and it's the same melody and the same thing performed in the space. And part of what this shows is how the recording space exists as somewhat of an instrument through which the the studio is an instrument through which people practice out different things in real time that get invested in later projects that, that, they're, that they're working on. Just to kind of talk about two of the other examples that I would have shared with you. One looks at a recording session in which that we can stamp, we can time stamp in terms of the particular date and time, the afternoon of June 9th, 2009, but also we can stamp in terms of things that were going on in our life because in the middle of the recordings, someone had gone to another room where the NBA finals were on. This is something that happens in June every, every year when I'm out, out there. And it's something that or structures our time, but they had heard as the beat was playing the way that the television and the beat interacted. So th it became an idea of let's record this television program and have this as a constant backdrop to the beat. And indeed, even in this, you can hear Tim talking about, are you still recording? What, what's going on? So those were two. And the final example that I'm not going to play with you, but that I think uh, is important. Both come from um, a session that we called the Styles Are Recording Session, which was a recording session, a hip-hop album that's never been released, but it was inspired by reading a biography of Joseph Stalin. And during this, t during this time, well, there are a couple senses where we have the beat 
we have a space right before the vocals are performed. So as the beat's coming in and you're listening and you're getting ready and there's a lot of banter going back and forth and power dynamics just to like, you, you're not gonna do this, I'll, I'll show you how to do this. And, and going back and forth that if you isolate the track you hear that sets the mood of the people that are in the place and what's happening. My final example, which I had absolutely no recollection of, was how performing, getting ready to perform a song. If you listen closely, not to my voice, because I'm like, check, check, all right, we're gonna go, we're, I'm doing the stuff people do on the microphone. But behind me, there's a Russian language lesson taking place, where two people are talking about Russian tenses and, and words, so this cre cre creates a zone. So just to, I wanna say that by excavating these recordings, and by ex isolating these tracks and listening to them, we get these clues that allow us to rebuild what was going on in that space and what was going on in that time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know the audio's not there. Okay, so, Amber, did you want to reply? Uh, yeah, the, the one comment I had had to do with uh, the way that you refer to your work as arts collaborative work. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is something we've talked about before, right? But I think it's... Be with you. Um, uh, so I think one of the things we spend a lot of time at in ethnography certainly is what word we're going to use, consultant, interlocutor, informant, um, native ethnographer. So we have a lot of, I think, elision um, and, and maybe some, I don't know, we're a little reticent about sort of what that relationship really means. Um, and I think along with that is this long history of working on music and sound and this old idea of the master-student or master-disciple relationship that comes from musicology and ethnomusicology and comes down to us. Uh, and I'm, I'm interested in the idea that maybe thinking of arts collaborative work is a way to circumvent some of those, I think, maybe old tropes, yeah. right? Yeah. But especially since we're working in digital media as well, right? Digital media and sound. Um, is thinking in an arts collaborative term maybe a better, more nuanced, more applicable way to think about the relationship between the ethnographer and the performer or the ethnographer and the sound? Completely. Com completely. Um, I mean, one, the, these, are, these are intellectual projects, and these are intellectual projects that we as people, uh, people of letters, with these letters, we can, can think that we state claim to, but... but, in, but um, these are just as much, and, and sometimes even more theoretically invested pro projects for, for the people that, that, that we do work, work among, um, and in, in different spaces, and in different times, and in different ways, particularly college-educated San Francisco musicians, which are very different than some of the other work people are, are doing, but just to give an example of, the, of this group that probably doesn't make my point as well, but um, I had someone quoting uh, Sidney Mintz, uh, to, to me, to me, one time when we were just talking about sugar and sugar in the workforce, and he, he was like, started to talk like one of my collaborators started talking about Sidney Vincent. So, 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 so there's just so, so there's 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 that. I also I like the idea of, of arts based, and I think you're right on because through the through the process of creating art, people working within the arts, whether they're performing arts or visual arts, really see that creative process as the research and as the understanding. So how does, again, the process, and again, a process that may be more driven by, I mean, it can certainly be driven by a final product and, and something that will be released, but even in spaces where you're just making music that may not be released, so it's about, it's all about the time together and the process. How does that process help to shape mutually shape, not just provide me with a window to understanding, but help both of us to work through and to understand things about the way that music gets made and that sound operates with power in these spaces. So yeah. Thanks, good job. Kwame, thank you. And first of all, I really want to hear the album inspired by the bio of Stella. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering, so there is a, there's a conventional hip hop narrative about the studio space as a site for creativity and a site where people can leave whatever other struggles they're facing outside their lives behind and focus on their art. And I really like how you're describing the cabin, first of all, being called the cabin, like it's a space away. It's not the one bedroom apartment, it's the cabin. Um, and the idea that practicing in the studio takes the best of that, of that narrative without the sort of endpoint 
that we often think of as intrinsic to hip hop and gets us into narratives about hip hop's relationship to capitalism. So I'm wondering um, how your work might uh, bring in that kind of conventional rhetoric about the studio or decenter it, like how, it, how that relates to what you do. Thank you. Um, I would like to think it decenters it, but I, I'm not 100% confident in that way. But, but in, man, in many senses, I think unreleased, again, this idea of unreleased work and this work that isn't driven by this future, this future uh, commodity that will go out or this future thing that we, even if it's not, not about making money that, that will represent you out there in such a way. I mean, for me, it, it harkens back to, I guess, the imagined narrative of hip hop of, you know, just starting out and paying your dues. And, and I think a lot of times we have artists romantically look back at before, before they, I mean, popular artists who are commercial artists say before they were engaged in all the things in the industry, those times when they were just getting together in the basement and rhyming together or DJing all night and doing that, that those, that those were, the, were, the, were the key moments. Um, at the same time, I, I, it's not a, a complete all the way, I mean, I think there, that is a little bit heavily romanticized. And, and I mean, w one point that you actually bring up is that I will share the, uh, the, 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 st the styles of our musical collection with you, but, <laughs> That's okay. but, but Tim has told me at other times that you know, he doesn't want that out. I mean, and, and he, didn't, he didn't quite say it like that, but he made comments about, he just recently released a cassette tape of his unreleased hip hop songs from 1998 to 2001, and it was released on Empty Cellar Records as a cassette tape, like this other guy who has this other identity has all these hip hop identities. So at the same time, we can think about the values that these unreleased projects do have at a later time, which may take a complete different meaning depending on where we are, but, it, but they still exist and they can exist as ways of shedding light on our identities and being reframed and repackaged to, to shed a certain light on our identity at certain times. So there, there, we're, there, that, that commercial drive is, 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 or potential and possibility is always kind of there at the same time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. The, um, the one thing I would bring up at this point is just, I think, um, really significant in the first three papers has to do with the relationships of class in particular to, um, to the making of gender uh, and the making of certain identities around sound. And it, it seems like, a, like this panel is in many ways speaking to like re refiguring the process of intextualization. Like how do things that are supposed to be front and center um, get reframed by fans and, and in spaces of informality or spaces of production. Um, and how do like the things that leak in, the social forms that leak in, then get remade as the center, whether it's by the ethnographer or by someone rethinking the commercial or rethinking gender or trying to make things legible and illegible? Because I think all of these three papers so far have talked about in some ways recentering the illegible, perhaps in interesting ways. But I think that's something we can talk about. And let me introduce our final formal sort of talk, and then we can open it up again. So our final paper conversation piece is by Ali Colleen Neff, who is a media anthropologist who works collaboratively with young people throughout the global south. Her first book, Let the World Listen Right, documents the musical cultures of the Mississippi Delta. Her current book project, A Body and Sound, Women, Voice, and Media in Dakar, Senegal, is based on her Mellon ACLS-funded fieldwork with women pop vocalists. She's currently visiting assistant professor of Africana Studies and Women's Studies at Virginia Tech. Ali. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for being here and filling this David Lynch set-like room um, for this panel on sound. Um, so um, it's exciting to be here. I've enjoyed working with these people over the years immensely. I also see people sitting out here who've influenced the work that I do, including, of course, Jim Peacock, who's uh, an influence on all of us. Um, and I'm happy to be here. I think AAA is a great place to think about sound because of what we bring to the table methodologically. So I'm excited to put this work into conversation with what you all are up to. Um, I'm going to talk for a second. I think I'm ready. Yeah. Um, talk for a second about what it feels like to be in my field. Hear a body mapped in sound. The phonographic life of the people of Dakar, Senegal, thriving. In my five years of ethnographic work with the young women vocalists of the West African metropolis, I have witnessed the immense power of the Dakarwa mass sonore, 
a cultural ecosystem bound up thickly in the phonographic medium. Through an extended collaborative engagement with these practitioners and their communities, I document the critical importance of women's voices to this cultural body, this sounded urban Senegaleseness. In Dakar, the work of women vocalists not only shapes the modes and institutions of community life, it also substantiates the struggle to survive the stifling circumstances of the post-colony. The fruits of this work take on many forms, some of them observable with the naked eye, others not visible at all, the distribution of sacks of rice in the midst of a Sufi chant, the influence of a Shantus's endorsement on the outcome of a national election, the contortions of the city map as women's ritual gatherings block and redraw the flow of traffic through the capital streets. So this is one of my field photos um, of a dance ritual, a sabar, that was happening this must have been two or three o'clock in the morning, a time of night called Suf Sed, or when the ground is cold. Um, and I spent most of the event down in the circle, but I took a little break and went on top of a nearby building, and this is what I saw. Because the voice bleeds over the edges of words, or rather, articulations work to make legible, but also to reduce and essentialize the possibilities of the voice, I wanted to approach the work of women vocalists of Senegal not just through the grain of the voice itself, but through the sensorium and to something else more than articulation. In doing so, I located the voice's confluence with all kinds of sounds in Dakar, feminine sounding, so the kinds of sounds that surround women as they move through the city, the kinds of sounds that come through them, um, come from them accidentally, the sounds of the children who gather, the sounds of domesticity, feminine sounding, as an, a way of thinking about how the city life of Dakar is undergirded. So conventional methods couldn't reach something that I witnessed to be true in the field. In terms of my field work, I'm talking about the power of women to affect the world around them. When in doubt, I turn to the germinal eth ethnographic productions of Trin Minh Ha, who tells us that when Western, Western representations are stuck in a rut, we must deconstruct and reassemble them. In doing so, we encounter and amplify the substance of humanity on its own terms. So I'll show you a brief clip from her work, Reassemblage, sometimes credited in 1981, sometimes in 1983, taken from her field work um, in the countryside in Senegal. So there's a lot of resonance. A lot of the people who would have been in a similar study 30 years later when I was doing mine are now living in this city because of drought. Um, so. I show this um, to my students in my media anthropology classes that I teach. This is known as a germinal work of video um, anthropology, of visual anthropology and of video art. Um, but what really tends to strike them is how jarring they find the sonic aspects of it. So. <laughs> In numerous tales, woman is depicted as the one who possessed the fire. Only she knew how to make fire. She kept it in diverse places. At the end of the stick she used to dig the ground with, for example, in her nails or in her fingers. <laughs> So working beyond trope to put the materials of ethnographic collection together in such a way that the, the hidden materialities of culture become legible, right? become audible. So I'm thinking about amplification as a methodology, making empirical substances legible right? that are often marginalized in conventional ways of engaging ethnographic texts. Um, to be an embodied researcher, not to echo Trin, to um, attempting to speak about, but instead speaking nearby as an embodied subject, or speaking next to co-affective processes. 
And I'm thinking about affective witnessing as a way to approach the field, locating extra narrative elements that can be sensed or imagined, doing research in the breaks toward hidden practitioners and at times when attention is most likely to fall away from a potential site of cultural production. So I'll show you an example of how Trin's work actually affected my field practices. This was part of a three-day wedding ceremony. Oh, a representative of an immense griot family from Gadjuai, the outskirts of Senegal, to a representative of another immense griot family. So this is a power couple, y'all. So they had a three-day wedding in Gadjuai that was very, very well attended. Um, the Banlu, the outer outskirts, poor outskirts of, of Dakar. And there were three days of drumming and dancing, and it was really awesome. And what I got to do was spend all kinds of time engaging these dances in all kinds of different ways. So I have hours of footage where I just laid on the ground and just filmed the dust in front of me as the dancers danced and watched them turn over that cold, damp, dark dirt, right, from the dry, you know, sun-baked dirt on the top. And I watched them draw circles, and I watched them punctuate the circles, and I watched them wipe the circles away with their toes and their feet and their jumps. Then I would just watch, watch facial expressions. And thinking about resources and materials for the, you know, for ethnographic collection, I was lucky enough to send out a few field recorders with some of the women I worked with. So I've got some of the griots who would occasionally stand up and sing a song. I've got hours of recordings of just that and all of the, their experiences during that time. Um, and then I've got recordings of the MCs. I've got recordings near the drummers. I've got recordings of people who were just kind of sitting on the edge of the circle. So I was able to get into all of these textures of my field materials in interesting ways. But for all of that planning and all of that thinking out, I didn't realize that this was going to happen. Most, if not all, of the literatures about Senegalese musical, about women and Senegalese musical performance talk about the ways in which they expertly respond to these complex rhythms of the sabar, um, the sabar drums. And indeed, they do. It's really immensely amazing to watch. Flinging materials according to their embodied engagement with these sounds. But what happens here is a woman, an expert dancer, comes from the margins of the circle. But because of where she's placed, we don't notice even the photographer for the wedding has turned his light away because it looks like there's just some action happening on the margins, nothing too interesting. Well, she walks out from the margin. She chooses her drummer. She signals a change in the rhythm. And of course, we're always wondering about how well dancers can respond to a beat and engage a beat. But what I didn't realize was that the musical affect is actually flowing the other way. That the natality, the, the, the um, creativity, the invention of this rhythm is actually flowing from the dancer through the drummer. So as you can see, I'm still focusing on the drummer here. And I'm kind of laying there being stepped over by the women of the Sahara. They're very good friends of mine until I realized that he's following her. Okay, he's playing her dance. It obviously took me a minute to get it. Yeah, Sabar is pretty sexy. So you see, the musical affect was actually flowing the other way. This is a year into my field research. I had taken Sabar drum lessons. I had been working with this family intensively for a really long time. And plenty of people have done studies of the Sabar and of Sabar dance. But here I was witnessing the affect go the other direction. What other kinds of authorship are we not detecting because of the ways that we're used to reading our field materials? and reading our field sites, right? So I'm also thinking about processes of reverberation. If that's amplification, if that's finding those moments of affect that don't get recorded, right, that don't get sort of empirical weight in conventional ways of approaching the field, I wonder what we then do with those amazing materials. 
that we've brought to light or we've brought to um, a hearing, attention. And um, I'm thinking again about Trin's work and processes of reverberation. That's processes of representation that are mimetic of the sonic event or sounded space itself. Deconstructing ethnographic representations that take themselves to be whole, progressive, and omniscient. And thinking about reverberation as enacting a collaborative, co-constitutive process of sounding in, through, and after the fact of ethnographic representation. So I'll show you an, an example of how I tried to put that into practice in my field um, with a brief clip from a film I made in conversation with Trin's work. So my series of films um, that I am working on from my field recordings in Senegal um, are called Reverberation. So this is from Reverberation One. It's a 10 minute um, documentary I did about women praise singers on the outskirts of Senegal. In fact, in the very same ground that that sabar was recorded at that very same week. Um, and what I did was I had been working with this dieta, this group of Sufis for over a year. We had gone through immense processes of ethnographic conversation. I had stayed overnight multiple times with the women, with the women praise singers and gotten to know them. I had taken pictures and given copies of all of the pictures to the people I worked with to see what they thought of them and to their Sufi leader. I had taken just sound recordings and made lots of copies of those CDs. So we had a really trusting ethnographic relationship and a lot of conversations about representation. So I took some of the field recordings and some of my field footage and when I started to put them together for the documentary, I invited the people I worked with in the field to come over and give me their feedback. And so I started with a soundtrack to this film and they kept telling me to put more reverb on it. They really had a lot of fun telling me how to produce this work. And I thought, well, this isn't really true to you know, what your voice sounded like in the field, but I did it and all of a sudden I, I felt that what was emerging was a representation of the affect of being in that um, godly Sufi space, right, that was so much more um, nuanced and so much more real than the idea of, a, of regular field recording fidelity. So I'm thinking about the concept of ethno-fidelity, right? How do we move away from the ideas of fidelity that would have us centering our analyses on texts? Right, and thinking about ethno-fidelity, how can I be true to what's material and legible to the people I work with? So here's just a brief clip from what we made together. find it on YouTube. But to make a long story short, um, that feeling of this overlapping sound coming from multiple directions is very much the feeling of being in Dakar on a Thursday night when the by fall are out every two blocks or so having these Sufi ceremonies with their amplifiers, borrowed amplifiers posted up on the closest building. Right, so I was able to get to that sensory affect in a really um, interesting way because of the recommendations of the consultants I worked with. So not only did my ethnographic text attempt to become a re reverberation of that feeling in the field, beyond that, as Kendra pointed out earlier, the ways that my film itself has been deployed over social media. So it's become popular over social media in the digital realm. It's posted up on my consultants' um, Facebook pages, right? It makes it into people's blogs. It circulates. I show it in my, um, my classes. All of my field consultants, I left them all with about five DVDs of the thing itself and um, uh, MP4 copies as well. So the ways that it is actually working through the world is actually a process of reverberation as well. Thanks. 
Great, thank you. So why don't we um, continue with some questions from the panelists and then we'll open it up to the floor. I can, I can, I, yeah, I, I, can, I can go. First of all, I, I loved how, um, in terms of my project and Kendra's project, we're talking about these kind of these spaces that are very much separated. I'm talking about a studio, she's talking about this, this moment and this zone of, re of rehearsal that's, that's prior to. Um, uh, Amber is talking, Amber, a lot of Amber is dealing with fans, but also this thing that's framed as a show, but, but, but how, how you're looking, I love how, Ali, you're looking at many of the same things, but you're just en engaged and embedded in everyday life and really the sounds of the city. So as opposed to something that's framed and isolated in a different way, it's, it's, it's very much a part of, of, of Thursday night in Dakar and, and other so sorts, of, sorts of things. I also, um, so that's one thing that struck me. Something else is, I mean, particularly in, I mean, there's so much, but particularly in the second um, example, in the example of drumming and dancing, how do we think about who is directing the creation of, of music? And, 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 and not just the creation of music, because we can think about musical ideas, but the creation of musical aesthetics, and in what spaces and what times are musical aesthetics being directed by, I mean, really by people who are outside the realm of at least those that are recognized as musicians. And I know that you've done some work on gender in, in that sense and, and women's roles in influencing and creating and in, in influencing and developing even genres that are seen as male-centered genres, but just that, that there are these spaces that don't get recognized. So I don't, those were more thoughts than questions. But. That's great. I don't know that this is a question either, but your work is always so generative for me, Ali, and what I was thinking about while you were talking is that it's very easy, kind of in the in the vein of the decentering that Jesse brought up at the beginning, it's very easy for us to take, um, to use metaphors of sound in the sonic to discuss the visual and the texted, and it feels to me like you are doing kind of a feedback loop here, where in talking about reverberation and resonance, you are noting that we use them metaphorically, engaging those metaphors and then putting them back into their sonic context and working out our metaphors in sound again. So you're doing what we've been asked to do by Stephen Feld and others, right? Making arguments about sound and sound. Yes. Amber, do you want to add anything? Uh, the only thing that I would add really quickly is something that I think maybe all four of us have touched on a little bit, and that is that in the 21st century, when you're working in digital media, the level of engagement that your uh, consultants and informants have with your work is different, yeah. right? This mm. is not a guarded text anymore. <laughs> There's nothing sacred about it. Um, and they're criticizing, collaborating, complaining yeah. all the time about what you're doing. I mean, I was thinking about you saying, you know, that somebody brought up Sydney Mintz. It's not unusual at all for me to interview a fan and for them to give me footnotes or to send me later an email with several things they want me to check on, yeah. right? So it's, it's a much different, more nuanced conversation, I think, than, than is maybe, at least from my perspective, sometimes taken for granted in this sort of ethnographic work, right? Because we're not talking about informants or consultants removed from the text because they are not. They are remixing the text yeah. mm -hmm. all the time, every day if you'd let them, right? <laughs> so I, I think there's some of that across our papers too. Cool. Why don't we open it up for some comments, questions from the audience? We actually have a, not a bad sized crowd here, but the room is so voluminous that we feel like we're in an airport. But <laughs> so please, why don't we, if I can see that far, um, questions, comments, and then we'll just start open it up for a bit more of a conversation. Yeah. seems like it could add a wonderful dimension to, to what you're talking about. Um, I, I'm thinking of Mark Katz's work with yeah. DJs, and he, he talks about the discourse that uh, Grandmaster Flash and others had about science and yeah. being a scientist, and it seems like archaeology is one subset of that. Uh, and then I just had a question about the, the transnationalism uh, that you're, you're interested in with regard to hip-hop, and just the sorts of, um, as an industry, this, this um, 
folks going to Scandinavia to perform for the diaspora? And, and I just wondered if you could elaborate. It's a, really an informational question more than anything else. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sure, thanks for the question. Um, I have a, I guess I would call him a collaborator and a colleague now who's, who's a longtime DJ who partly through some of my suggesting has become a librarian that, that I mean, and it's, it's different from being an archeologist, but, but the work that DJs do in terms of being intellectual, being historians, putting things together. So, so, so that's an incredibly powerful and important point. And in many cases, I think, I mean, so songs can, and one of my examples had at least a couple of samples and the way that, that there's a different archaeology of the music. And as much as we, like sometimes in what, what I was presenting today, I was largely talking more about the vocal, the, the, the performance of vocals, because the music isn't so much performed, but it is assembled in, in ways. But I think that assemblage and those assemblages become incredibly powerful ways of how, I mean, it's an assemblage of music that gets reframed, recontextualized, re-put in different ways to create songs and to create certain, certain affect and certain impact within, within the, the, the sound. So that's, that's incredibly imp important. Um, what I, I like, just to touch back on the vocals, what I like about the vocals is there's a lot of time when you're doing vocal tracks that, I mean, if you don't have this isolated booth with just someone there, there are other things going on. And indeed, some of the practices that I was talking about lend themselves well to people kind of walking in and out of the room and it just being this casual space. But again, these are things you don't pick up. And you prob probably need some like CSI kind of things where you isolate the background sound instead of the, the foreground sound. But there are, uh, that suddenly you, re you can realize all of these other things that were contributing to that space in that moment often not in the main vocal, the loudest vocal, but in the other sound, so the sound of, of, of floor creaking that, that, that suggests the shift of a, a body weight or, or, or such things like that. So, but yeah, it's a, gr it's a great question and point. Yes. Um, I'll try to be brief. Um, most of my interlocutors are, are musicians and artists and they imagine themselves always at an interface with what I term the transnational hip hop network. Um, and I think of it as a network because I see hubs emerging with like one or more connections between them, so kind of network theory. Um, people are not always engaged in that network in the material ways they would like to be, but they imagine themselves to be part of it. So a lot of what I do is look at the ways that Moroccan hip hop artists are always thinking them of themselves in a transnational space aesthetically even as they lack some of the resources that people in other parts of that transnational space have. So the DJs that I worked with in Morocco did not have the ability to be archivists and historicists in the same way because they simply didn't have vinyl. That just, the recordings that I played today are, um, the tracks are both created by Sultana's little brother, right? And they're great, but they deviate from established conventions in some ways and mirror established conventions in others because of the tools he has at his disposal. So it, it, different resources and practices of necessity generate different aesthetics that are local, and yet people always argue that they are connected aesthetically and ideologically to the transnational hip hop network. Um, for Sultana in particular, she has been able to connect to that network in some ways and connect to this other thing that's related but not identical, which is the sort of circuit that you get into when you start being, as she has, for example, invited onto the International Visitors Leadership Program that the U.S. Department of State funds and comes to the U.S. and does a tour with a bunch of other artists from around the MENA region, or um, gets invited to the Oslo World Music Festival and, and this one that I was talking about where she's specifically held up as, a, as someone who celebrates the kind of Muslim women that we think don't exist enough, and so we pick them out to celebrate them in this very Western-centric, very immigrant-fearing or immigrant-phobic discourse, right? Um, so she, I think, is ambivalent about that. To be honest, it's difficult to get her to discuss the politics of it, I think in part because um, she's trying to make a living as an artist, and to discuss it means putting herself at risk um, because she feels obligated to take, to take these jobs. Uh, and I, I want to point out that she can be sincere in wanting to spread her message and critical of the means she's given to spread it at the same time. So uh, the ways that she's imbricated into what I'm calling, 
what we've called on our panel the global culture industries, but what I'd also like to mark as like a sort of effective labor industry, are really difficult. They're difficult to map. Thanks. Thank you. I questions, comments? Yeah. Example number two. Yeah. What happened afterwards to her status? She had moved from the outside to the inside in the dance. What happened outside? Jim Peacock with the challenging question. Well, so um, Sabat is really fascinating in how it works anyway. It's a series of people who jump up. It's a ring of women. The only men involved are the drummers themselves. Um, it's rare that um, anyone else would want to get caught. Any other men would want to get caught gazing at a Sabar circle. Sometimes they'll peek from the rooftops. Um, it's really for women by women. It's about self-authorship, so one by one. The women jump into the ring, usually one by one. Sometimes the second woman will jump in with the first one. And they make up a dance. They articulate themselves. And they, the more I got to understand the dance, they choose a drummer. They set the rhythm. Um, and then they improvise on that rhythm. And they author new, what's called a bach, which is a um, drummed phrase. So these box that we think of, oh, this drummer is really good, he's got all these rhythms, is probably a drummer who is playing out often and is very good at being responsive to the rhythms that the women are coming up with. Well, they jump in the circle, they do a turn, it lasts between 10 and 30 seconds, rarely if ever longer. And then they jump out, and this goes on, this went on for three days. Yeah, and they jump out. What was amazing about this woman is that she did so well. The better you do, you start to collect any loose materials. So the women around the circle will take off their headscarves, they'll take off their jewelry, their watches, and they will put them on the dancer. Sometimes they get them back and sometimes they don't. And depending on how nice a piece of jewelry it is, sometimes it's performative, sometimes it's real. They will put money in your hand. You see she had money in her mouth. Right? They start to, all of a sudden, any loose materials in the scene start to gravitate toward that center of creativity. And that creativity, depending on its weight, its aesthetic weight, is rewarded materially with cash or things that cash can buy or should buy in Senegal. So it's really, by the end of a sabar, I've sort of done a, um, and uh, excavation of the materials around a sabar. You find braids that have been flung off of people's heads. There's some spare change half buried in the ground there. All kinds of little bits of material buttons that have popped off, spangles, little shiny things everywhere. Um, and I always theorize that the more stuff you find buried in the souf, that telltale ground in Senegal um, can tell us just how good a party it actually was. But, but anyway, the woman who gets the stuff, after she takes the turn, she slings back, and if she does very well, that's the end of her, her articulation. She quits while she's ahead. She either leaves the sabar and goes and has some dinner, or she hangs out on the outskirts. Thank you. I've been, I've been told the question, uh, can you please use the microphone? So I think you had a question in the back. Can you come up and use the mic? No, yeah. Yeah, please. Thanks. in front of everyone. Um, so my question, I think, more has to do with representation and alterity. And sorry, I have a little bit of cold, so I also have a cough drop. Um, and I'm trying to do this in my own work, too, to deal with sensory ethnography and representation in a sensory way that doesn't always, it, it does evoke universal affect, but then how do you represent alterity? Like, al like different ways of understanding or experience affect when you're using things like film and sound. And that's my question. <laughs> I mean, in some ways that reminds me of Amber's d description of illegibility in some ways or the yeah. desire for it. I don't know if yeah. anyone wants you know, to speak I, that. I do a lot of work with, with alterity as well because um, I mentioned that heavy metal sometimes gets portrayed as monolithic. Queer culture also gets portrayed as monolithic uh, by the mainstream. Uh, and so I'm, I'm also sort of very invested in uh, dealing with, uh, for example, 
trans fans of heavy metal and their alterity in multiple, you know, it's like the world's biggest Venn diagram, right? How altered can you get, right? Um, and I, I think that pinpointing that, um, especially in, in something like, like film and sound and, and field work, uh, that can get, I think, even more slippery than it is. I mean, the, the more focused you are on alterity, the more slippage there is, I think, between what you're able, the, the sort of the substance, the evidence that you're able to draw, right? Because alterity sort of lends itself to a quickly disappearing trail of evidence, right? Um, I almost think of it like disappearing ink, right? Do I have the right light to flash so that I can read what got left on the wall? Uh, so it, it's a tricky problem. How do you get to that sort of altered sensory experience when um, the very sort of system that you're working within doesn't lend itself to seeing, remembering, uh, or sort of portraying that particular experience in, in any real way? Um, I'm doing a lot of work right now with trans performers and trans fans of heavy metal and am, am stuck in that slippage in a lot of ways right now. How exactly do I capture what appears for me to be a, a, you know, multiple layers of alterity? How do I capture that in a way that even makes sense for me textually, right? Because even if I try to portray that uh, in not just a scholarly language, but English, right? How, how do I do that? And I think um, part of what I'm trying to understand is that my difficulty in explaining that altered space is their difficulty in communicating that altered space, too. So I'm trying to understand that sort of friction as perhaps where the alterity is best understood, trying to identify those spaces of friction as the ones where I'm spending the most time, um, if that helps and makes some sense. Nice. No, I, th I think the other place I see that in all of your talks has to do with um, and I'm thinking of some people in the audience's work as well, like the materiality of sound, how it sort of gets located, not just in what's not in textualized, which pieces of discourse are pulled forward, but how you feel and hear the space, or how like, you know, you feel the technology of recording or the space or the incidental that comes forward, and you feel it in a different kind of way, rather than the best technical piece, in fact, quite the opposite. Did anyone else want to play? Yeah, please. Okay. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure this gets at the question the right way, but, but in terms of how I was thinking about it, I was taken back to Ali's experience with making the film and, and just the idea of how things are mixed and how people prefer things to be mixed, how things are mixed when they, to sound right. And I, I think as we deal with different medias and different sound technologies, the ability to, to, to allow for, for, for um, all sorts of different readings of this is how this sounds best to me, how this sounds right to me, how it sounds different to me, can just tap on some different ways of, of at least breaking up the universal and thinking about the more particular. The only thing I would add, I again don't know if this addresses the question, but I'm in thinking about the ways that we are all talking about um, the limits of using ourselves as evidence collecting instruments, like the the break between what we experience and then the process we go through by representing that experience to ourselves and then translating it into various media that we publish. I'm wondering if there isn't like a worthwhile, I'm only half joking, attempt to, to like track yourself as a subject experiencing even as you go about doing the other work that you do. Like I'm reminded of the YouTube sensation of like a guy who put his GoPro the wrong way for his entire vacation. Like what if I stick a GoPro on myself and then forget about it and go around like experiencing concerts and interviewing people? Like what would it help me to recall would that help me to think of myself in the position of a fan and a subject in a different way than I think of myself? I'm, I'm mostly joking, I think. I'm not sure. I'll just briefly say, I think, um, I think it keeps me honest to know that the process of representation is always fraught with essentialization, and it's a problem, and it's difficult, and I I'm doing my best to hold myself to those ethics, knowing that it's always haunting what I work on. But I think um, it's staying present with that. Um, I think there's something about methodologies that respond to alterity 
So I worked with five women, five particular women over the course of two and a half years in the field, and then in the three years since, um, engaged in deep and um, consistent conversation with them about how they want to be represented. And what happened was five different chapters of my dissertation and my book project became five radically different studies with radically different methodologies and radically different approaches. So I guess there's a methodological alterity um, that might help to evidence um, that kind of difference beyond a binary West versus the rest kind of difference. But I think that tricky question is something that I'm okay with being uncomfortable with. We have time for one or two more. Um, Roshan Akeshti, um, UC San Diego. Uh, thanks to the panelists. I feel like I should step back. This is very loud. Um, so I think a lot of us probably move through uh, a number of different disciplinary sites where the question of sound has become more and more central. And um, some of the it's interesting as you know to, to also step back and think about the kind of paradigm that is forming around that and and the discoveries that are made um, when we when we move across these sites one of my one of the things I'm interested in is thinking about what in particular ethnographic methodologies enable um, in an, in an, our engagements with sound um, that you know, uh, for you know, at the risk of of everything you risk when you use this word, that are exceptional. Um, and so I'm I'm thinking about um, Anthony Kwame Harrison's um, particular performance ethnography means of doing and being inside the music, mm -hmm. and perhaps. Um, Think, using that as a way to imagine how performers themselves are inside the music, learning from the music, learning from the doing of the music. And um, I'm also thinking about um, Ali Colleen Neff's um, kind of, you know, honing in on, on these um, uh, almost ephemeral events that, that you encountered. Um, as you, you frame that through uh, Trim and Ha's work, um, so for example, the, the reverb, and I, I would liken that to sort of the centrality of the drone in devotional musics throughout you know, the Mediterranean region and South Asia. There's something about that particular modality, the reverb, the drone, that lends itself to devotion. Um, so when, so I think one of the things that I want to caution us against is kind of having an enlightenment 2.0 where we suddenly are like, we can do, you know, we can sense the world with our ears and all these other ways and map them and have this omniscient kind of capacity to know everything all the time. And to use this as an opportunity to kind of decolonize our ways of knowing so that we learn from the modalities that our interlocutors learn from rather than coming to these modalities with this omniscience and applying that and using our you know innumerable technologies of recordings to collect and collect and collect and collect and collect. And 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 you know one thing I'll end on is one of the things I love about um, reassemblage is the silence. The work that that does, the insistence that that silence does. And I think that, you know, those, um, the ethical that you um, insisted that we kind of consider, um, I think now that we have entered this Enlightenment 2.0 or whatever it is, it's important that we bring into this intersection the critical, post-colonial, queer theoretical, you know, anti-racist modes that have enabled us to arrive here in the first place, right? We didn't just get here because we're smart. We got here on the backs 
of the people who we study. And so I, I wonder if some of you could speak to that. Let's take, why don't we take our final question and then we'll maybe do a quick wrap up because we're just about out of time. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask if you could speak a little bit more about the difference between thinking about work that's been unreleased and work that's not yet released and what we could learn from that difference. And then um, with your question of ethno-fidelity and like the crisis of representation, I was wondering if you have any sort of methods for following your evidence as it moves about in the world. Like, do you have a way of understanding the circulation of what you've produced now that it's been released, um, thanks. So thank you, why don't, why don't we each take a, just a second, we're pretty much out of time, but to respond to these last two really powerful questions. Okay, I'll be really, I'll be quick. Um, in response to the first, the first question, I, I think that's an incredibly important point. And, and in some ways, I try to pull back from, from what we think of as traditional methods as much as, as, much as possible. And I, I try to be present and be learning and in collaboration with, pe with people doing research. At the same time, this audio excavation is, is very much a, a way of taking this old model of what empirical kinds of findings we have, and it is something that as I work through, I need, to, I need to see the value in it, but also recognize the potential danger. So I think that's, that's really, really critical. Um, uh, an additional thing in, in response to um, unreleased work, uh, one additional thing I can say, and we can talk about this more afterwards, is that unreleased work does not become part of um, the musician, I mean, the, the, the artist's public identity. And, 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 and so it exists in the space where it can, and, it, and, it's, and it's there, and, and it, it always has the potential at different times to, to come in and to move from the space of unreleased to, to, being, to being released. But I think that that's one important point of, of how it's situated, it's moving, it's, it is unreleased, but that's, that could be a permanent state, in it, but it always has the potential of, of coming out and how that it just reflects, and when it comes out, what does that mean to someone's identity? But I'm just speaking quickly because we are, we're almost out of time, so we could talk more about it. Great, thank you, Kendra. I was just, uh, Roshana, thank you for your question. I think it's kind of the question for the panel. Um, what do we do now, right? So I, I would just, say in response to that only that uh, one of the things that that I constantly am trying to do better is think about the ways that my interlocutors exist in a space where to me it's it's helpful that you called it enlightenment 2.0 because they exist in this space where sometimes they identify in ways that we would think of as um, constitutive of liberal subjects and sometimes they don't so mm, Mapping is maybe not the right word, given your critique, but uh, at least being aware of those possibilities and the uh, possibility that one holds both of those things in tension at the same time, and that things like appear or don't appear, or facets are present or not present, depending on the situation, um, or the context in which people are feel called to represent, uh, is, is an important part of what I do, and I can't do it without some of the discourses that you mentioned. And the final one. I would just add to that that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always a little troubled by the idea of an ethnographer sort of learning how to make the music as a way to understand it from the inside better. I'm a little cautious of that. Um, I'm trying to learn bass. Is it going to help me understand heavy metal better? I don't know. It has helped me understand that I don't know how to play bass. Uh, and, and much as though I may want to sound like Godflesh when I play bass, the chances that that's going to happen are pretty slim. Um, but at the same time, though, with that critique in mind, I also think that we need to think about listening differently. I think it's very easy for us to think about playing an instrument, right, or doing the singing as the performative act, and then we separate listening as though it's passive. And listening's not passive. And I, you know, some of that is because I come from a jazz studies background where it's all about the listening. It's all about what they call in jazz the sounding, right? Um, so I, I think that there has to be maybe some conversation about um, changing the importance that we place on actually listening to the music as, as an active, performative thing. 
uh, because I, at least for me, studying heavy metal, that's the way I see it. It's not a passive, let me sit back, make some popcorn, and I'm going to listen to God flesh for two hours. That's not going to happen, right? But that that listening is indeed a performative musical act, a sonic act, that we can understand that way as well. Um, yeah, I, you know, I always, to the first question, I always try to ask myself, what kind of intervention am I making here? Is the idea to take the work of hidden practitioners that has operated on its own terms because of its undetectability and its illegibility and make it legible and to colonize it? Why am I doing this, right? Um, so the object, sometimes I get concerned that the object is to lay bare or expose the hidden workings of this work that um, the, the, implica the ethical implications can be very grave. So it's something that I try to stay present with all the time. Um, I guess this goes to number two, the question of, of ethno-fidelity. You know, I think there is something to be said for long-term native language, deeply engaged field work for all of the questions that that leaves open. What does that mean? What kinds of experiences do we have? Who are we in the field? Um, complicated questions, but for me, learning Wolof for years before I went to the field, right? Spending two, year, two and a half years working with the same people day to day, seeing them in and out day to day, to the point where they really are giving informed consent about my project. They've seen what I do. They see what my books look like. They see what my websites look like. I explain to them who's absorbing this and who's reading it in order to have a better sense of um, what kinds of gnoses and what kinds of situated knowledges the people I work with would like to tell the world about so that I can help to amplify what they, the, the practices that they think would most benefit from amplification and to leave the rest to them. And I think it's a deeply fraught process and one that I'm always trying to, to work through. Um, I think that's a good note for us to end on. I, I want to thank our panelists. This has been a, a really fruitful conversation, um, particularly linking things that we can move forward with. So thank you guys, Rachel, and thank you for coming and participating. Thank we can you. continue the conversation. So. All right. Mic off.